For today's deck testing video, I am going to be taking for a spin uh, Empire Tokens build. Uh, this is a little bit different from a traditional tokens build. It's still very aggressive, still very uh, early, but if I was going to classify tokens, right, the Guild Sworn version I play is certainly more aggressive. I would call that like an aggro token build because there's an awful lot of uh, reach and just, how do I want to put it? Uh, more uh, aggressive creatures in terms of like it's small bodies and you're trying to swarm them. Uh, you can still do that with this particular deck, but this one, if I was uh, going to kind of describe the playstyle, is a bit more mid rangey. And what I mean by that is, is that because we are basically taking, um, you know, the token build and then throwing in some of the more mid rangey creatures that Endurance provides, I'm talking about uh, Hunting Spirit, Young Mammoth. Uh, the new Empire Oathman is in here. I'm running Emperor's Blade. Uh, Varen is in this list. You can kind of see where you've got big bodies where it might make sense to kind of trade in to things, kind of play for the board more frequently. Cloudrest Illusionist enables this. Uh, you do have Edict of Azura in this build. And then on the top end, uh, again, normally the top end for my tokens builds uh, that are aggressive are like charge creatures and or lightning bolts or things to close out the game. Now this list does have cliff racer, but outside of that, you don't really have like traditional closers. So instead the top end here is designed to kind of reload the board after they've played a board sweeper. So it's things like Clivia, Tullius, and then I'm actually running three necromancers. And the necromancers actually have uh, a lot of interesting targets in this list. And, you know, General Tullius can also be hit with it. Uh, I'm running one Black Marsh Warden, which is kind of cheeky. Uh, you can hit with it. But even things like Mudcram Merchant are a good thing to pull back. Pawn Broker can be really solid because you'll also get the plot, um, so on and so forth. And then when you add in like Fifth Legion Trainer and Divine Fervor, uh, you can chain Necromancers at that point. So uh, again, the top end of this is more about kind of like reloading your board as opposed to just closing out a game because you, you lack that ability. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. Let's do what I always do, right? We're gonna go ahead, jump into some games. Um, as always, there's gonna be the deck code in the video description, and we're just going to uh, hop in. Hopefully, hopefully I won't be plagued the way that I was earlier today. I was playing an awful lot on my breaks at work today. Uh, lunch breaks and then my afternoon break and uh, things did not go well today. I basically fell uh, over and over and over again to really bad hands. Um, I was only playing aggressive lists and somehow even post mulligan I was routinely having uh, hands where my like everything all my cards were for casting cost or more. Uh, like this particular list has nine one drops and 24 two drops uh, and even with this list earlier today I had a, a mulligan where I was suddenly like Emperor's Blade, uh, Talius, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, thankfully we at least have the Mud Crab Merchant here. We're going to throw the other two back. I'm throwing Pit Lion back because I don't have the ring and because I don't have a, a quality enabler. And what I mean by that is something like Scouting Patrol, Marked Man, etc. Something that's going to make Pit Lion easier. Now, had we had the Scouting Patrol... Hold the line. I would have kept it, but as always, it always shows up too late. And, you know, like clockwork, if I would have kept the pit lion, then we would not have drawn that. We would have led Mud Crab into Thieves Guild, but something would have contested Mud Crab and killed it. Because um, that's just the way that things always go. Now, Thieves Guild is uh, something I would consider to be a flex card or an optional include. I'm doing it because it's a, another uh, cheap green creature that fills and floods the board it kind of cycles itself it's also uh, of a color that would help you in terms of uh, triggering your oathmen things like that so before we attack let's see if we can find something uh, interesting we don't really have a lot of actions uh, and we we actually have one cost creatures uh, we have marked man and mud crab so this would at least let us get two of them out, though there's only one mud crab left. But we don't really have a lot of actions, so I think we take the uh, Archibus here. And then we'll go ahead and do this. Ooh. Ooh. Both of these are solid. It's more a question of, like, what do we want to not deal with? And I think the answer is this. 
Though we do have the uh, Emperor's Blades. I actually think we're going to take the... No, I mean, we've already got Talius. We got more six-cost creatures. Let's let's just take this. Into the bridge, and... You will die where you stand. Whoops, did not mean to click I that. Sometimes that happens. All right. So next turn, we're going to drop a four-drop. Those mud crabs were lackluster. Like, it'll likely be Tullius on six. This will probably be a turn seven. And then, you know, some combination of fours might be our turn eight. That's thinking ahead based on the, the knowledge that we have. Perhaps we'll draw some stuff in between there. Uh, seeing Kinsman in Talvani, a little bit weird, but not completely out of the ordinary there are some people that just run a last gasp focused build and this has a solid last gasp um nice with cruel fire bloom if you need some health oh sorry i was busy doing the fish stick huh busy doing the fish stick huh all right so in this instance I think it's going to be attacking and then just, again, playing a 4-drop. Still probably going to go with the blade because it's more stats, even though this one's slightly more resilient. This gets absolutely obliterated by negation, however, which is a concern. And as such, we'll do this because uh, this is going to be our new turn 5. Almost assuredly. We'll play Fervor, get like one round of solid attacks, and then likely fall to Ice Storm at that point. Because them's the breaks. But again, this deck, unlike other uh, token decks or other aggressive token decks that I play, uh, more about reloading the board. Hey, look, it's that negation that we were worried about. So we're going to lose two creatures here. At least... Maybe even one more. I have to assume we're going to see the trade here. Gets it off the board, gives them some health, makes sense. And then uh, if they've got something else like a Black Hand Messenger, they might combine trade into this. Otherwise, I fully expect this to be a trade into a Mud Crab. But I don't think that pushes us off our game plan at all. We still want to get the fervor down and get as much value out of it as we can. And again, this just reinforces that we are, in all likelihood, up against last gas. Um, we actually might want to take this trade here. It's five less damage, but now that we know that they're on last gasp, There's a chance they don't run Ice Storm. Also, gives us the possibility that if they don't have something else, this trading in might hit our face and then these all survive. Because everything here has now two health or more. Alright, well. So there's the Black Hand Messenger. That did hit face. Rather nice for us. All right, so this will nuke this as well while also giving them some health. And a couple of different ways we could go about this. I mean, we could just drop Tullius, but I feel like... Wait! Did you hear that? My spear. This day will be mine. I feel like just dumping bodies... Uh, is good. I'm okay with this because if they do have the Ice Storm, uh, at least as of right now, uh, this would survive and this would survive. So you're really only losing the Crab and the Marked Man, but you kind of put them in a position where that is uh, tempting to them. Now, they could also play Debilitate. It's a new tool, and Debilitate would uh, at least neutralize a lot of our threats, but again, wouldn't kill some of them, and this would still be able to pilfer, which is a pretty big deal. The hist provides. Your destruction is at hand. All right, well, that does create some sadness. It does create some sadness, if only because we really wanted this to pilfer. 
but it does not appear that we will get our way. Unless we get a prophecy or draw a new tool. So we'll go ahead and do this. And there we go, see? Sometimes you gotta remember what your options are. Standing by. Fire canker blossom. Let's actually uh, just do this now. I'll take them with me! So that was a bit of a sequencing mistake in my opinion. Uh, this should have attacked first just in case it hit here. So. Oh. Sometimes I'm clicking faster than my brain and sometimes my brain goes faster than my clicks. But uh, right now, again, no ice storms, just last gasp things. And that should be uh, enough to kind of push this home for us. Because if they do not have an ice storm, we are in great shape right now. Standing by. We can continue to utilize this recruiter to flood our board for us me. pretty effectively. And at this point, we want to play, again, more things that would survive an ice storm and be beneficial to us. So in this regard, what I think we want to do is play uh, an Emperor's Blade over here just because it's a good-sized body and the Agent over here because this would uh, give us, you know, the guard in return what have we here? in that uh, situation. Uh, again, debilitate also an option, but debilitate would not like be enough to to Swift deal with us. So like the the here they're going to cycle through and kind of hope for the Hail Mary. Oh. You have an enemy last of us. From the gods. And uh, that should be it. I mean, they're they're cycling through. They want those last gasps. Maybe, perhaps they've got the uh, the daily. Battle now. All too simple. So they gain some health again, they go up to 8. That will not be enough. And we will take game 1. And I'm going to celebrate winning game 1 by uh, taking my own victory lap via drink of coffee. Oh, that sweet bean and nectar. So, pretty standard fare as far as like tokens go. Now we'll see if we can stand up to Ebonheart. Uh, if this ends up being the Slay Ebonheart, I'm actually not convinced that it's a good matchup for this particular deck. The other version, uh, the Guildhorn version I play, I think is actually very, very good against Ebonheart because you can uh, typically race them and then by the time they do clear the board, as long as they're not also gaining health as a result, uh, you can traditionally close it out with the reach that's available. In this, because you're more built to reload, like they clear your board and then because of like the power of Unstoppable Rage or because they've ramped to like astronomical amounts, you're not likely to recover. Even if you flood the board again, they're just going to be too far ahead at that point. So You can trust me. Uh, instead, it does look like Earl here. What have we here? Oof. Would have much rather had the uh You can't defeat me! The mammoth going for us. That was an awkward spot because we had the lion with no activator for turn one. Didn't see and this then we have the pawnbroker. You will die where you so now we have to hope they don't have any sort of silence or uh, removal. So that this can can get in their way. Hopefully. Though I imagine they have something. There's a lot of tools there. Uh, movement effects. You know, Shadow Shift is very strong. Things of that nature. Move aside. Imperial business. Oathman is also very strong. Because it's going to go ahead and give them a buff. So it at least enables some quality trading. 
I We're gonna go ahead and get this bed. in. I'd like to set something up so that I could use Cloud Rest to trade into this. So I think what we're actually going to do is uh, go with a Mammoth over here, and then we're going to use our Ring Charge to uh, develop with House the Pawn Broker. The other option was uh, we could have played like Emperor or Empire Recruiter into Pit Lion. Get out of my sight! Would have been completely reasonable as well. Let's go ahead and play a mud crab merchant. Oh, interesting. So we have we have the Empire recruiter that has the pilfer. So taking underboss makes sense. But if we don't close it out by turn ten, uh, this breeding pit could be dangerous. We're going to go ahead and get these wax in here. And then, again, slowing down our opponent is really important because uh, though this is like a go-wide token strategy style of a deck, uh, we just play it more like mid-range. We, we've got these big bodies because of the endurance creatures and things like that. We want to utilize them. So when you can take valuable trades it's really important to do so with uh, this empire token style deck thus far earl meister here a uh, great player by the way uh, streamer as well uh, earl meister here been playing an aggressive version but later on we might have to watch out for rage in case he plays a, as a like a surprise factor play even like the aggressive or mid-range Ebonheart lists, a couple of them have been kind of sneakily sticking in some rages because they'll also play like Vigilant Giant, Belligerent Giant. Honestly, even a young mammoth just kind of hanging out would be a, a pretty dangerous rage at times. So we'll have to keep an eye on that, or at least keep it in mind. We need to get rid of Joe Run here. Because... They're going to get to flood the board for for cheap. I'll bury my Just in the nick of time. And the swish with the shutdown play. Quality, sir. Quality. All right, so we're going to do this here. Just trying to keep this alive, which is, you know, heads up strategy. Not a lot I can do about preventing that, sadly. So next up, I think what we're going to do is go ahead with uh, Pit Lion. Recruiter, and then just because we have this, I mean, even if, even if this gets silenced or removed, um, the removal would be hard removal. It would have been something like Fell the Mighty, silence, it's still going to have five attack and can still trade. Like, putting the shield here I don't think is a detriment at the moment for uh, doing so preemptively. We have a nice, solid, wide board. All right, so there is the giant. This edict is very, very helpful, though. Feel the might of the empire. So I think we're gonna take trades here so that we can uh, edict. And then now that it's a reduced cost edict, we'll be able to develop Pet Lion over there again, which makes uh, the most sense. Because of the cover, we hopefully don't have to worry about uh, this being an issue. We're still at 12 health, so hopefully they do not have a source of, you know, 10 more burst damage, which might sound 
a little bit weird or crazy. You might be saying to yourself, how, how would they have 12 burst damage with uh, 8 magicka? But, but, it is actually possible, theoretically, with a load of Dagath Daggers and Steel Scimitars. Our opponent does have... Uh, what is that, seven cards in hand? Yeah, seven cards in hand, so, you know, six of them are plus two damage. They could do it, in theory. But uh, Earlmeister concedes, and so that's going to be it. Uh, this list goes 2-0. and oh. Kind of got to see, you know, how it functions. In my opinion, I think this was a good representation of the, the way to play this list. You play it, even though it's a token deck, kind of like a mid-rangey token deck. Uh, because you don't have as much reach, you kind of have to fight for the board, utilize your uh, creature quality a bit more. But uh, yeah, deck code will be in the video description, like always. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, until next time, may you walk on warm sands.